Hi, it's Dr. Ronald Lett. This workshop is about implementation of randomized controlled trials, the lessons from our MAID initiative. The MAID initiative meant the Maternal Augmented Digital Education Initiative. We had funding from the Fund for Innovation and Transformation and the Donner Canadian Foundation. Partnerships involved the Ministry of Health, Benue State, Nigeria, from the Honourable Commissioner to instructors at the School of Midwifery in McCurdy and the School of Midwifery in Mkar. CNIS staff, both Canadian and Nigerian, were involved. Me as curriculum director, Svana Nucho as scientific coordinator, Isaac O'Henny as Moodle developer, and our gender specialist, Jan Kristalaw. We had help from the University of Alberta School of Public Health. We had Stephen Hodgins as the professor with two of his graduate students, Rafat and Anja. You know, we got $250,000 and in these days getting money is so difficult. You don't just get it for showing up. You really have to have a context and prove that you've got an idea of how this is going to function. For an innovation project, the Whistler principles to accelerate development are a good place to start and we did that. We used the WHO framework for quality midwifery education and we looked at what educational intervention evaluations would be best. I would recommend you look at the Whistler principles if you're going to do an innovative study. What does this involve? Promoting inclusive innovation. There has to be a focus on the poor and the vulnerable. Take intelligent risks. You have to experiment while doing no harm. And for us, this project was implemented from 2020 to 2022. So we had to figure out how to work around the pandemic. You want to produce and use evidence. This means you have to disaggregate your data if you're going to have something to say. Seize opportunities. During the pandemic, there were many digital innovations and you had to be on top of those. If you're going to get funded, your solutions and your activities have to be scalable. You have to have a place to integrate proven innovations. And in our case, this was into the larger midwifery education programs. And you have to invest locally not only financially, but share talent and other resources as well. The talent of our Nigerian colleagues, the talent of our Canadian participants. Your project has to be worthwhile. We use the WHO framework on quality midwifery education. It's known that midwifery, where care includes proven interventions for maternal and newborn health, as well as for family planning, could avert over 80% of all maternal deaths, stillbirths, and neonatal. Over 50 outcomes are improved by quality midwifery education. This is a busy slide, but I would like to look at this middle circle here. We want to reduce mortality. So there needs to be a reduction in harm to women and neonates. There are needs to be improved psychosocial situations. Interventions need to be reduced. Public health needs to be improved. And there needs to be improved service. This will result in improved survival, thriving of the patients, and transformation of their situation. How do you evaluate educational interventions? Evaluation drives both learning and curriculum development. Summative evaluations can no longer rely on a single assessment tool at the end of the rotation or at the end of the class. 
New assessment tools must be used to assess and evaluate different components of performance. Assessment needs to be part of an ongoing evaluation cycle. In this day and age, you need to keep curriculum fresh, educationally sound, and you must achieve intended objectives. We chose for our evaluation to do a randomized controlled trial. You will hear details about how this was conducted, but randomized controlled trials are the gold standard. There is some aversion to the randomized controlled trial. First of all, because of its rigor, the results are not always positive, and that means that you risk not getting more funding. So if you want to get a good result, maybe you do something other than a randomized controlled trial. But funders are getting more astute and are less likely to fund you if you choose a mediocre means of evaluation. The two studies shown on this slide, the first one did not show a positive result. The second one did. That's what happens when you do a randomized controlled trial. In conclusion, innovations are a big part of what is going forward in development. Innovations need to be inclusive, scalable, and integrated into a larger context. Quality midwifery education is needed for an 80% reduction in maternal and neonatal mortality by the year 2030. Randomized controlled trials are the gold standard. Disaggregation is important if you're going to understand what your results mean. RCTs are difficult and costly. In implementing this pilot, we were interested in doing more than just a proof of principle. It was important to us to understand what practical issues may influence effectiveness, uh, both in the particular settings where we did the pilot and much more broadly in, in a diverse range of settings across uh, Africa and, and beyond where this uh, approach could be used. So we needed to assess feasibility both for you know, the actual delivery of the course and then also for how we uh, expected to evaluate impact. So before delivering the course, we had uh, numerous discussions with uh, the staff and uh, the nursing students, um, you know, both through uh, you know, uh, uh, kind of interviews as well as through surveys and uh, in doing that, we looked at a, a number of different issues, including uh, the reliability of access to internet, smart or smartphone ownership and access among the nursing students, uh, their familiarity with uh, email and with doing uh, uh, surveys online, and a, a range of other factors that uh, could have a, uh, an effect on our uh, implementation or um, how we were going to do the assessment. And all of this was uh, helpful, indeed uh, essential in uh, planning for implementation. Once we'd actually uh, delivered the course, again we we, we queried staff and students uh, using surveys and gratif gratifyingly we found that the course was well received and that in general the implementation had been uh, quite smooth. I've listed here uh, in the last bullet a number of uh, technical factors that we found contributed to successful delivery of the course. Now for this pilot, what we were, what we were testing is a, a, a novel uh, mode of delivery for what was already a, a well-established training package. But the, the, the traditional uh, mode of delivery for, the, for, you know, for this training package was uh, in, in small groups uh, led by uh, you know, skilled uh, you know, clinical preceptors. Now, the only problem with that traditional mode of delivery is that it uh, has fairly heavy um, human resource requirements, which uh, means there's a kind of a constraint on, on, on scalability. Uh, so what, what we were wanting to demonstrate was that uh, by delivering this material uh, digitally that we could get um, 
it's kind of equivalent effectiveness. We were not interested in being able to show that this was pedagogically superior to in-person training, but what we were aiming at was a, a delivery modality uh, that was more readily scalable uh, and that could be uh, delivered uh, in a more efficient way than through uh, in-person training. So that being the case, a, a non-inferiority design uh, was, appro was, was appropriate. From a research design perspective, uh, as I've indicated, indicated here, um, this didn't have much consequence in terms of the overall design of the study, but it, it, it meant that we had to take into account uh, you know, this as our, our, as our key research question when we were uh, uh, determining um, sam needed sample size. So in, uh, with a non-inferiority study, uh, first we have to uh, make a dec decision about what uh, an acceptable inferiority margin is, um, uh, you know, below which we would uh, not be able to claim non-inferiority. So uh, in our case, using the composite uh, kind of post-training uh, performance score as the uh, as a main outcome measure, uh, we decided that that any score uh, or that that uh, a score that was uh, no more than five percentage points lower in the innovative digital arm, uh, we would consider to be uh, equivalent. Uh, and so, so on, on that basis, we were able to determine um, the, the needed sample size. Another feature of our uh, evaluation design was uh, to use a, a, a crossover uh, randomized control uh, design where uh, in effect uh, each of the study participants uh, would serve as their own uh, control. Um, so all of the students that were participating were uh, exposed to both of the, the, the delivery uh, methods and this uh, rem removes an important uh, kind of source of variability in a study. So even with a randomized control trial just by uh, just by chance, you may have uh, unbalanced arms where there, there are still systematic differences between the two arms. But using the, the design that we've used, um, th that's an important potential source of variability that's uh, removed. So here I've uh, diagrammed out uh, the design of the study. So this was implemented in two different nursing schools in Nigeria. Uh, in the, the first of the two nursing schools, there were uh, 50 participating nursing students, and in the second school, just under 100. So we divided up the participating students uh, into six cohorts. So two cohorts uh, in, in the first school, and uh, four cohorts uh, in the second school. And in each case, this uh, uh, dividing the students out into cohorts was done uh, with random assignment. So looking first at, uh, at, at school number one, um, so you see we've got uh, six content modules that were delivered and all of, the, all of this material uh, was packaged in two different forms. So either uh, digital, digital delivery or a conventional uh, small group uh, delivery, uh, you know, by a by, by a trained uh, clinical preceptor, and the sequence um, differed. Where um, where in one cohort, you know, they alternated doing the uh, the first module uh, uh, digitally, the second module small group, third module digital, uh, and on, uh, and then the, uh, the you know the second cohort. Uh, um, uh, you know, did it uh, with, 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 the, with the alternate sequence where they started with a small group and then digital and continuing from there. So uh, again, this was kind of randomly determined uh, kind of which of these two cohorts took uh, which of these uh, sequences. So similarly in the, in the second school, we had about, uh, you, know, you know, 24 or 25 uh, students um, kind of randomly allocated to each of the, uh, the, the four cohorts. And the, the, the four cohorts were then grouped into two. Um, and then, and then within, within each of those pairs, it was randomly determined what sequence uh, the students had for um, uh, you know, digital versus uh, small group across the, you know, the six content modules. 
So in, in doing the analysis, we're, you know, there's a, a kind of a variety of ways that we're able to, 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 to come at this. Um, first of all, kind of sticking with the original, uh, or sticking with the crossover uh, design, uh, we're, we're able to look at uh, within a given, uh, within any single cohort, what was their average score across the, you know, the three modules that they did uh, using the small group um, um, delivery mode versus the three modules they did with the, the digital. Um, uh, also, we're able to kind of analyzing, analyze it, looking at the average scores uh, for each of the modules, uh, like across uh, uh, across all six cohorts, comparing the you know the three cohorts that did it uh, digitally and the three that did it uh, in in small group, and then you know summing the scores across all six uh, modules, uh, we were, we, were, we were able to compare you know digital versus uh, small group. So as you see, in, in doing it this way, we uh, were able to ensure kind of good balance across the, the study arm. So that the one thing that's varying is, is the, the, the mode of delivery of the content. Hi, my name is Isaac, e-learning manager at CNIS. In this presentation, I will demonstrate how we use learning management platform specifically Moodle to conduct randomized control trial. This is in relation to a project we conducted with Nigerian midwifery students. Based on the objectives of the project, we had two main different ways of delivering the lectures. These were online modules using learning management system and the traditional modules, which was the face-to-face -face classroom settings. We divided students into groups using a tool called cohort in Moodle. To use this tool, I scroll down to site administration, then click on users, then go to account, then click cohort. And these are the groups of students that we created for the project. So when I want to enroll students in a specific cohort, I just click here and browse their name over here. Let's say Ben, then I'll just click here. And if I click on this one, it will add Ben to this cohort. Right now, this was for demonstration purpose, so I will just remove Ben from this cohort. The division was made such that each student had the opportunity to do each of the two mode of delivery. For instance, if this is Mahmoud, he will have the introduction model via online, then wound management and basic surgical skills would be in classroom. Moodle comes in two versions, the mobile app and the web. With the mobile app, it has both the Android and the Apple version. The mobile app was recommended for this project because students could browse through the courses without or with low internet connection. But for the web, if you don't have internet connection, you don't have access to the course at all. On top of that, most of the students had your own personal phone but when it comes to a computer or a personal laptop not all of them could afford it however it takes much time for any change in the course to reflect on the app which was very frustrating also the app was poor in displaying interactive content that we developed with h5p which is a plugin we utilize to improve student engagement. This is an example. Look at how this content appeared on these two set of devices. In our project, all our surveys were done using Google Form, but moving forward, we want to use Moodle because it has this feature already where students can respond to 
surveys and it's a powerful tool and we don't have any reason why we should ignore this. We also want to improve on our interactive videos for our models, which at a point in time could ask student questions in the middle of the video they are watching. So for instance, we can ask students questions in the middle of the video and choose to deny the student from proceeding if the student does not get the answer right. I don't want to take much time and I'll end by saying now learning management platforms are coming up with varieties of tools to make courses very interactive. Try to have some time and explore them and you will enjoy them. Thank you. Good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Dr. Fanan Ujo. I'm, I'm presenting on logistics and troubleshooting experiences from the field. And this is uh, basically a presentation that uh, seeks to bring out the issues around uh, issues we face in the field during our interventions uh, uh, by CNIS in uh, Benue State, Nigeria. Now, the local context within which we are doing this presentation is Nigeria. Um, we'll have a brief on the presentation on the population of the country, which is estimated at about 211.4 million, with Abuja as the federal capital territory. And uh, it's quite important to note that um, 2 percent uh, that this population of Nigeria represents a total of 2% of global population. But curiously, and uh, quite alarming, is the fact that the 23% um, of global maternity debt burden is, uh, is, 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 uh, uh, is accounted for by Nigeria. And uh, we also have other very not so pleasant uh, um, uh, statistics around maternal mortality ratio as you can see there. Um, for the actual location, the location of this um, project is a Benue state, which is in north central Nigeria. And um, uh, it's located about 300 kilometers southeast of um, Abuja, the federal capital territory. Um, so uh, the, the actual locations where we had these interventions were two schools of midwifery, one located in Makudi, the state capital, and the other in Nka, near Boko. Uh, this, the population, as you can see, there is uh, about 6.8 million. And that's an estimate, you know. We're having uh, our census um, uh, sometime this year. Yeah, uh, the last census was about 16 years ago. So we're still relying on an uh, estimated population here. And um, the population there is largely engaged in a smallholder farming. Now, another important um, health you know, uh, um, statistic is that uh, the SBA, that's the, skills, the skilled bet attendance within the state is quite low. And uh, from studies we have conducted in the past, which we can reference later, shows that uh, the, the statistics are not so encouraging. Now, here's a, a map of the area, uh, the study area showing uh, Benue State, and, and, and it's uh, within the context of Nigeria, and Nigeria within the context of West Africa and, and Africa generally. Um, now, regarding the, um, uh, the logistics for the project proper, we divided this into two. One is um, around... Uh, uh, infrastructure, which is internet and GSM network availability within those locations, not broadband. I'm, I, I need to emphasize not broadband. We, we had to rely on GSM network, their internet connectivity, which in many cases at those locations were not, are not really very strong. And also the, the issue of um, power, that's electricity, to power, um, uh, you know, the router, you know, that we, we, you know, uh, we needed electricity to do that and to also light up um, the house where we're doing our presentation. The router and data was also another key critical um, logistic that we needed. Um, teaching instruments brought in by CNIS were also a major resource for the training. And then, of course, there's also an issue of access to rural PACs. 
in the case where we had to visit for uh, the CMDS app. Now, for midwives and students, that's at the individual level, the challenge we had were some of the students did not have uh, smartphones and some did not have Google, that's Gmail accounts, Gmail email accounts, they did not have it. And then, I, so it wasn't surprising when you could find some who did not have the knowledge on how to use Google Apps like the email and the Google Forms. And uh, finally, the challenge of having data was also there, uh, you know, and um, we we uh, had to, in fact, set up a quick training uh, for the students on how to use Gmail uh, accounts, you know, and then how to also fill the Google Forms. Now, at the institutional level, in terms of the challenges, we had quite a number of challenges, but the ones that are very critical, I'll just run through them quickly, was the unpredictability, uncertainty in the strength of internet connectivity. So we, we had downtimes, you know, while trying to upload documents or, or upload forms or even uh, transmit videos, we had challenges with the connectivity. This was beyond our control. So we'll just pray and be hopeful that uh, we had a good day in terms of connectivity. Now, the other issue was um, uh, the use of data for non-project uh, activities. The students typically, students are are like that almost everywhere. They, they would um, rather use the data, sneak out sometimes to be able to, to download um, videos and pictures, uh, you know, for their later use, you know, and that uh, meant that there was a lot of pressure on uh, on the available data bandwidth that we're using. And um, in fact, we had to be changing the password almost on a daily basis to be able to survive this. Um, now, like I mentioned earlier, we had challenges with, uh, with the power to charge the um, router. Now, uh, we had to depend on uh, an alternative source using a generator, which at some point broke down. We had to fix it CNS had to fund the fixing of that generator and fuel the generator all through the course of the training. Uh, going forward, we had the challenge of also uh, router signals, which were uh, uh, stronger within 25 to 30 meters radius, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, so when you have a long, a larger hall with uh, the number of persons, like in the hall, the halls in Makodi, uh, it will be challenging for some persons to have access to uh strong uh, you know uh, signal strength of, of the, the the router it was a challenge a major challenge a major challenge uh, now the each of the router who um, in principle could connect 60 people but the fact is you could connect 60 but uh, it meant also meant that the the strength and this the speed was quite very slow so to for optimal performance we were doing 30 half of that this was another challenge. Now, at the individual level, that the students with instructor level, some of the students did not have smartphones, and they, and there was conflict in terms of um, the timing for their lectures and, of course, their clinical practicals vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the CNIS training. So we had to find a way to reconcile this so that students were not too tired, you know, after their lectures and could be able to pay attention to uh, the training that was offered by CNIS. Now, some students, like I mentioned earlier, do not, uh, do not have email, G email accounts. This had to be created. Uh, and then uh, some used other people's accounts and it was quite challenging. They could not respond to mails in good time because they had to depend on uh, other people, a third party who would give them information. Ah, you have an email and so on and so forth. So it was a bit challenging. Um, so essentially, these were the challenges that we faced. So in, in, in summary, um, we still believe that the major consideration for uh, a remote training will always be the internet connectivity, the wireless internet connectivity. So we, we decided to put up a few questions here, critical, critical questions to consider when you are trying to set up uh, this kind of a training in a country like Nigeria. Uh, you want to know how many participants are involved in training because this will determine the um, internet connectivity you want to put together, are you going to get one router or two or three or four, depending. It also determine how many days you're going to 
if you are going to break them into uh, groups how many groups are you going to break them into how many days would that take you to reach out on, on one single module you know and then what gsm service coverage is available you know uh, which is stronger which has uh, the which is most cost effective you know and then um, uh, can the institution where we the beneficiary institution can they afford the subscription post uh, the project intervention these are questions that uh, we think should be considered when setting up uh, the internet connection so i want to thank you ladies and gentlemen for your time and attention and uh, we will we'll, we'll listen to your questions and contributions and observations. Thank you. Hi, my name is Anya Junic and I was working as a research assistant with CNIS and I am also a recent MPH graduate from the University of Alberta. I do not have any financial or other relationship with for-profit or non-for-profits to disclose, so I'll just get started with the presentation. I will talk about how and what kind of data we collected in the RCT, give a quick overview of the data analysis and reporting, and discuss some issues we faced and next steps. So let's start with the data collection method. We used mixed methods to collect evaluation data and the results of the RCT that we conducted with 148 second year midwifery students in Nigeria. The students and instructors had to complete multiple surveys throughout the planning and implementation phase of the digital training. And the service primarily consisted of closed-ended questions, but also included some open-ended questions. And I will talk more about each survey in a moment. But besides surveys, seven students and eight instructors were also chosen to participate in needs assessment interviews. And all students had to complete the Objective Structured Clinical Examination, in short OSCE, after the digital training was delivered. All surveys throughout the study were delivered online using Google Forms and the interviews took place through Zoom. Despite students having received previous training on how to use Google Forms, we faced some challenges with the online delivery of surveys and interviews, and I will talk about that later in the presentation. But first, what data did we collect in the study? We collected data during all three phases of the study, so before, during, and after the intervention, which was the delivery of the training. During the pre-implementation phase, we conducted a needs assessment with students and instructors. They first received a survey and based on the survey responses, we purposefully selected participants for semi-structured interviews. Students and instructors were also asked slightly different questions due to the difference in the roles. But both the needs assessment survey and interviews sought the participants' understanding of gender equality in midwifery, the rights of mothers in the clinical practice setting, and their competencies and digital skills. The rationale for conducting the needs assessment was to ensure that intervention could be successfully implemented. Then during the intervention, we had four types of data collection tools, um, a pretest, module quizzes, which students had to complete at the end of each day, a post-test, and the OSCE. The first three assess the students' knowledge uh, of midwifery, clinical skills, and critical thinking skills. The pretest included 22 questions on all six modules of the digital training. Five of the questions asked students to self-assess their clinical skills. Then the post-test asked the same questions again, but included an additional five questions, so a total of 27 questions. There were six daily modular quizzes as well, one for each module, and each quiz had 10 questions testing students' knowledge. Lastly, the OSCE contained six practical stations, which tested the students' clinical and behavioral skills. And this means the students had to perform a certain procedure and were then scored by their instructors based on how well they performed the procedure. 
The final survey was an evaluation which collected data on the students' and instructors' confidence in digital skills and knowledge about maternal rights after participating in a training, as well as their overall experience with the digital and small group delivery of the training, the barriers they faced, and suggestions for improving the digital training. So just a short quick overview of how we analyzed and reported the data. The interviews were thematically analyzed and included in the report to the funders. To report quantitative data, we had initially developed a testing measurement framework with outcomes and quantitative indicators. To account for the outcomes, we did descriptive analysis of all the data and calculated the statistical significance between the digital delivery group and small group delivery. We also used difference in difference analysis in the pre and post test and when applicable in the needs assessment and post intervention evaluation survey. The data was also disaggregated by midwifery school as we had two participating schools and if necessary by gender, age and midwifery entrance exam performance. Now, for the purpose of comparing data from pre- and post-intervention, we included only data from 130 students who participated in all surveys during the intervention phase. We analyzed the data in Microsoft Excel and SPSS, and all the analyzed data was included in a report to the funders. Now, with all data being collected online from participants in low-income countries, the process was not always smooth, as you can imagine, and we faced several challenges. I will now discuss only the six major ones, and the first one being timeliness. So this was a huge issue for especially conducting the needs assessment. We experienced a delay of several months in completing the survey in both midwifery schools because the students were on ward or on vacation and often didn't have internet access. As a result, the needs assessment interviews were conducted up to a week prior to implementing the RCT and simply couldn't be used anymore to inform the implementation. Another significant challenge was internet connection. Due to poor internet, students weren't always able to participate in the surveys on time, and this was also a challenge during the implementation phase. But with surveys, we had somewhat more flex flexibility, so most students successfully completed the surveys. A poor network, however, was a major challenge during interviews. We had to reschedule them multiple times, and the often poor network also influenced the data quality. Another challenge related to online service was the use of Google Forms. So even though, as I mentioned before, CNIS has pro had provided a training on how to use Google Forms, a significant number of students was unable to complete the surveys without help of an IT instructor or the project coordinators on ground, and this oftentimes delayed the data collection process. Another challenge with Nigeria being a low and middle income country, not all students owned a digital device or better said a smartphone that they could use to access internet. Those students faced of course additional barriers to participating in the data collection process, but they usually ended up sharing phones with a friend or borrowing it from somewhere else. Um, distributing surveys through email added to the challenges as well as it was difficult to get up-to-date email addresses from all participating students. Some students had multiple email accounts or were unable to access their accounts and had to create new ones without notifying the CNIS research team. So surveys were sometimes sent out to wrong email accounts and we had to keep updating the email addresses constantly. Lastly, the testing measurement framework we developed for the study required us to report on gender outcomes. And this turned out to be almost impossible because of a very small sample of male participants. So we only had nine male participants compared to 139 female participants, I believe. 
Um, and reporting on gender outcomes would have led to findings being misinterpreted, so we couldn't do that. So where are we going from here? The CNIS team who was involved in the study is working on a manuscript to publish the results and lessons learned from implementing a digital training with midwifery students in a low- and middle-income country. Last year, the RCT proved that the digital delivery approach was efficacious, but we still need to test whether it is also effective. And that is what CNIS is currently working on. So it is doing an effectiveness study in Tanzania to test the feasibility of implementing the digital training in an uncontrolled real-life setting. This spring, the Director of Curriculum Development from CNIS traveled to Tanzania to monitor the implementation of the digital training with a cohort of 27 nursing students. The plan for the coming weeks will be to then implement the digital training with another four cohorts of nursing students, but this time without monitoring it, to assess whether the digital training will be effective in a real-life situation. A slightly modified version of the digital training has also been implemented with a cohort of clinical officers, and more clinical officers are yet to complete the training. Work is also in the way to make the digital course available on the Education Hub of the UN Institute for Training and Research, and the training might also be implemented again in Nigeria in fall. So CNI has, has been improving the digital training based on the RCT and implementation in Tanzania and will continue improving it as it is being implemented in future. And this brings me to the end of this presentation. So I just want to thank you for the opportunity and your time.